You're tuned to Radio Kidnappers, the voice of Hawke's Bay. This is a program called Real Wealth, and it's our pleasure, as always, to have in the studio from the studio group in Hastings, Glenn Trillo. How are you going, Glenn? Very well, thanks, Ken. Just remind our listeners, Glenn, now, Stuart Group, what it's all about, Real Wealth. Yeah, it is. Um, and what is, what's it all about? And we are a goals-based uh, financial planning um, company. Yep. Um, so we find out what is important to you about money, what your future goals and objectives are, and then we build a plan to um, faci- you know, facilitate those requirements. I suppose the good old days are really gone, aren't they, where, you know, when I was growing up, um, in the late 50s or 60s, you went to the post office, you put your money in the bank, you got mm. through 4%, and you were happy with that. Yeah. Does that happen still these days or not? Oh, we still come across people um, such like as me. yourself. Again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, look, I mean, there's a variety of reasons for that, but there's certainly a, a much better option for people. Yeah. yeah. Are people more aware of it? Or do you have to define that you are, it's not quite a maze, but that people just aren't aware of what the options, options are? I think people are aware that there are alternatives out there, but mm. um, specifically what those alternatives are, perhaps not. Mm. Um, you know, that, that comes with um, really just asking the question and um, do, doing a bit of uh, do a bit of homework on it. And never too late to come and see you. Sorry, never it's, too it's late. Never too late to come and see us. I mean, naturally, the earlier that people can come in and see us, yeah, and um, I guess in their life cycle, if yeah. you will, yeah, um, and younger years, the better it is. Um, but certainly, never too late to come and see us. Now, today we're going to talk about people who uh, make bad money decisions. Mm. We've all done that, haven't we? Uh, we have all done that. <laughs> I think we all put our hand up on that one. And, you know, people um, often will make up um, excuses for these short-term decisions that they make, which really is counterproductive to the longer-term goals, is often what we find. Mm. Mm. We've got 10 bullet points, and uh, let's get straight into them. And the first one that you want to yeah. talk about is, uh, I just want to wait till things become clear. What does that mean? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if I reflect back in the last six months um, in the world share market, it's been fickle. Mm. You know, it's been a little bit vol- volatile. We have had the tariffs between the US and China. You had a very limited bombing campaign in Syria, uh, which unsettled the markets. And in about wide tangy day our time, you had one of the largest single day drops in the US market in a number of years. Uh, they were concerned about rising interest rates. Yeah. So yeah, we, we, we sort of found some people saying to us, look, we like the idea of putting more money in or, or commencing an sure. investment portfolio. But it's, it's a little bit fickle. It's not particularly clear at the moment. So that's often used as an excuse. Yeah. Um, certainly um, a way to overcome that is what we call dollar cost averaging. You can commence an investment portfolio with your lump sum for those um, with a lump sum to invest. Mm. You could put that lump sum in in a number of tranches over a time period. So it's a form of dollar cost averaging your introduction yeah. of funds. Do you find that's the downside to things like the share market? I think the average person probably thinks, just like you uh, talked about there, that, oh, well, you never can tell what's going to happen. What's Donald Trump going to say next that might influence the market? What's going to sure. happen in Iraq? And last month, that you you and I spoke about bricks and mortar and uh, the pros and cons of it, but I think that most people listening to us right now might think, mm, shares, bricks and mortar, yep. bricks and mortar, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, and, you know, uh, our listeners who have um, been and seen a few cycles in the in, in property mm. will have seen property vary in price as well. Yeah. Um, the latest thing on the um, that's in the media at the moment is the Reserve Bank Governor Adrian Orr has come out and said, you know, we're we're, we're a whisper way of seeing a property correction in places like Auckland. Um, so it's not all roses in property either. Indeed. Yeah. Do you find that the share market is much more volatile than bricks and mortar though? Uh, yeah, it is. Yep. Um, but having said that, if you, since we started to collect data on the um, share market, uh, there's always been volatility, and there, there actually needs to be volunta- mm-hmm. uh, volatility. It creates an opportunity for investors to, let's face it, if the share market is on a bit of a downer, you can buy more shares for your sure. money today than you could last month. Yeah. Um, so you, you actually need that volatility. Yeah. It also ensures or helps ensure that you don't get a particularly large bubble in the share market. Because if it just keeps going up and up and up, a bit like property at the of moment, course. if it pops, people are going to be out of pocket. Yeah. Mm. And from your point of view, though, it's all about diversity. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, your next bullet point is I just can't take the risk anymore. Mm. 
And that's really to do with um, risk appetite for people mm. and, and understanding that um, you know volatility in the share market is actually a good thing. Okay, so it's important um, you know with your financial advisor to look at your risk profile, and you probably do that every. 12 to 24, well, actually more like 24 months. Have a look at your risk profile. Does it keep you awake at night by having too much money in shares? How well diversified are you? Um, is what you're invested in, does it have lot high liquidity? Can you get your money out of it you know, easily? Um, so it is important to look at your risk profile every 24 months or so. Yeah, do you have a plan? Uh, that's another good point you raise there. You look at it every 24 months, but I mean, someone who's say might be single, got a good wage coming in, yep. you might suggest to them that uh, we go into a, a higher risk area for growth funds. Whereas I come to you and say, look, I'm getting married uh, next month, Glenn, might you then say to me, well, okay, maybe what we should now do is start looking at this high risk profile that you've got and change it. Is that what you do? Yeah, very much so. Um, so so people with a defined cost that they're going to have to meet at a, um, at a date in the future, whether it's for a wedding, a um, helping their children out mm. with a house purchase, so a lump sum of money, we would manage that tranche of funds differently than we would their longer term funds, mm. okay? Because devil's advocate is, if you come to take out a lump sum for a, say, a property purchase, you don't want to be doing that when the market has slumped mm -hmm. or is on a bit of a downer. So you would maybe segment that um, amount of money and put it into a lower volatile um, investment such as bonds you know fixed yeah. interest turn deposit that sort of thing um, so certainly you, you'd you'd you, you'd arrange the investments to suit the requirements of the investor and what the funds are going to be used for is it true that there's never a good time and there's never a bad time to get into a market yeah i i think um once, once again, it comes back to your stage of life, what you're saving the money for and the amount that you're putting in. Mm. So the argument is, so a lot of people think when the market is doing really well, that's the time to put in a larger lump sum of funds mm. into it. But often that can mean that you're buying at a high. In an ideal world, and you, and you can't do this by the way, no. uh, the um, utopia is you buy low and you sell high. Um, you can never manage to do that consistently time on time. So I think dollar cost averaging, but not only for the introduction of funds, if you're able to dollar cost average for withdrawing of funds is a good good idea as well. Here's a, uh, the next point, I suppose older people might uh, go along with this. I want to live for today, tomorrow can take care of itself because you never quite know when the Grim Reaper is going to come knocking at your door. No, and say, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a spot for you on the next bus, Ken. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, and, and look, I... Um, Certainly, I think you can probably have it both ways. Um, you know, you need to look after yourself. Mm -hmm. You need to um, ensure that you enjoy life, buy the things you want to, but also, yeah, the chances are you, you're going to live to the average age. There's a reason why there's an average life expectancy because, on average, yep. most people are expected to live until about that age. So, I guess accept that, but. Living like that can also be reckless mm -hmm. if you just throw caution to the wind and it often just means that you haven't thought of a plan, you haven't come up with a plan. So I think note down what it is that your goals and objectives are, speak to a professional, put in a roadmap or a way to achieve that and you can have those ad hoc purchases but I think you can put in a plan as well. You talk about a midlife crisis particularly with men, you know you get 40 mm. or 50 and then all of a sudden you're driving around on a Harley Davidson and your hair's getting longer. Yep. Do you find that as actually true with people that come and see you that they, they do go, go through midlife crisis and think, well, you know, all of a sudden they want to take their money and they want to do this and do that? We actually, what well, I actually find, it's more prevalent for people who have just retired. Mm. So age 65 through the first three years, 65 to 68, the, pe the amount of money that people spend it's that's the highest amount that they will spend in retirement mm. for most people really okay and then they'll get into a passion thereafter so they'll often go away on, on your overseas trip buy a new car buy a new camper van mm -hmm. or caravan buy a boat that sort of thing so the expenditure in the first three years post retirement is the highest that it will ever be really and then they'll get into a passion thereafter but they will also 
I think also just trying to find out what retirement means. Yeah. Yeah. And we spoke about it prior coming to where, and uh, I'm certainly not looking forward to it because I think a man in particular needs a purpose. Yeah, yeah. As his wife will tell him. Yes, and when you're at home with your wife um, all day, (laughs) every day in retirement, that creates challenges. (laughs) I don't believe the next one, but obviously it's true. Uh, Some people say, I don't care about capital gain, I just need the income. Capital gain is what life's all about, isn't it? Uh, it, it can be, but for some people, um, capital gain is fine, but until you realise it and you actually sell it down, mm. um, it doesn't put food on the table, no. um, you know, it doesn't um, pay for your holidays, um, new car and the like, so income's important. I think you need both, I think you need, you need capital gain and income. It can't be all about income though. Um, you know, I think back to global financial crises, yep. CDOs or collateralized debt obligations, they're all about income mm-hmm. and um, they didn't work out too well for people. You mentioned it before, diversified approach, yep. and that's really what I think you should be looking for. Your next topic is that you want to get some losses back. Mm. Uh, I suppose that's like gambling, isn't it? You're going to put another $2 in the pokey because this machine owes you that money and you just want to get it back. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. And uh, the, the, the other analogy that I use is a bit like if you have an older car, maybe mm-hmm. it's done 200 or 1,000 kilometres, yep. you spent good money on it, you know, you've done the CV joints, you've done the steering rack, you've, you've um, repaired the transmission, you do all these things, and you don't want to sell it because you've sunk so sure. much money into it. Yep. So you keep it until the next problem arises. Yeah. You think you also need to know when to cut your losses. Yeah. Mm. And that's a great analogy because, you know, if you put a fortune into an HA Viva, it's still an HA Viva, isn't it? It's always going to, going to be. It's only going to be worth 600 bucks. Exactly that. And yeah. the kilometers aren't getting less on it. No, that's no. right. Now, we, we can get attached to uh, stocks or funds or strategies and we could say to ourselves, this, this has been great to me. Yep. Why do we hold on to stuff like that? Yeah, sure. And we certainly find um, you know, the, this in, in shares and in, in equities. Um, it's really important that you do rebalance because for, for shares that perform very well, we know, and we know historically, they, they will correct, they will come yep. back, they will um, have their own, so they're having their time in the sun, um, they will pull back, and if you keep a hold of those stocks long, long term, mm-hmm. and you don't rebalance a portfolio, when they do correct a bit or they do drop a bit, you will be the one that will be caught out more than others. So rebalancing your portfolio is important. When I was growing up, and I might just be that I'm getting old and not in touch with the market anymore, but you used mm. to hear this thing called blue chip shares, and you couldn't go wrong with it. They're, they're blue chip. Yep. Do they still call them that? Are they still around, those things? Yeah, they are. Um, what, what people consider to be blue chip mm. um, shares, or what we call large cap shares, if you will. Um, so they are still around. Um, what is, what, go, is, what they, does blue they, chip mean? They can go wrong as well. Yeah. They can go wrong as well. So Main Zero. Main Zero yeah. was never supposed to um, fold as a company. Fail they, safe. Fail safe. Yeah. Well, it did. Yeah. Um, Fletcher Building has had its challenges. That's another blue chip type mm. company. So very much so. And the challenge or the error that people make with these companies is they don't particularly diversify. So they they think it's a safe form of Mm -hmm. investment. They put much of their liquid wealth into just a few handful of blue chip companies and they think that they're very safe. Um, But what they've actually done is they've actually increased their risk profile because they've only got a small number of these companies and quite a sum of money Mm. invested. And so when one goes bad, that can make a real material impact to them. Tell us about newspaper headlines. Well, they're there to sell advertising space, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, they, 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 uh, they, the media is there to sell advertising. So the more out there the um, headlines are, great. More people read their articles and the more advertising they sell. When um, earlier this year, if I go back to early February, when we saw quite a drop in the share market in the US, all across, and this is globally, it was blood on Wall Street, mm. you know, um, massive sell off on, off on stock. What they didn't report is for everyone who was selling shares at that time, there was a buyer. There had to be a buyer, sure. otherwise you couldn't sell it. Yeah. And those buyers were the, the buyers who who know or, or worked out very quickly, you can buy more today than I could last week, so why wouldn't I? Yeah. And, and, and it was always going to recover, it has recovered. But that's the media. Yeah. I wonder though, 
A great term that's come into the uh, into the media since uh, your friend Donald Trump's come into power. My friend. <laughs> my friend. <laughs> He's my friend. <laughs> he brought into t- uh, into the, um, the dictionary fake news. Mm. And, you know, personally, I now just about doubt every headline that I read. I think, okay, well, there's got to be a backstory to that. And am I reading the truth? So where do we get the real news on investments, for instance? So, you know, if, I would think that a lot of people now might doubt what they read. Would, do you find that? Yeah, I do. And um, I, I, I like to think for a long time um, I have always questioned what I read. Mm. So I think it's really important that you, you don't just go to the one news source. You know, you, you look at various news sources. Uh, I actually look at um, a, a, you know, three or four global news sources as well. Um, and it's quite interesting, no matter what the subject, whether it's investments mm-hmm. or um, international relations, call it what you will, go and actually read the other side of things and see what they are saying. Okay, and it's, it's in stark contrast to what you may often read. And it just allows you, I think, to form your own opinion. So I think take it from more, sure. more than just one source. So on that basis, we definitely need to come and see an advisor like yourself. Certainly rather than so. just get out of the paper. Yeah, most certainly. Yeah. Yep. Because you're not there pushing a barrow, are you? Not at all, not at all. And we will, um, we'll, you know, allow you to see beyond the noise. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's always been noise in the media, um, and certainly in regards to share market. And, and you see these um, um, television um, things where you have all these numbers going across the yes. bottom of the screen and up the side of the screen and across the top. It's just all a load of nonsense. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it really is. It's just noise. It's, yeah. yeah. What about a tip off someone? You know, say, well, look, I've just heard the word on the street is. Sure, we've heard that before. Haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> the word on the street is diversification. Um, yep. So, look, I mean, in all seriousness, those people who have had a tip off, this is the next great stock. If you really must invest in it. It, it's it's like buying a lottery ticket. Put in no more money than what you can afford to lose if you want to take that gamble. Yeah, mm. I'm not sure which one we should actually uh, talk about last because they're both really good. Um, maybe let's have a look at. I'm too busy to think about this, but that's a mistake, isn't it? Yeah, it is a mistake. And also to really school your up yourself up on um, these sort of topics and and investments, it takes a lot of time. Um, so once again, I think engaging a uh, advisor uh, would be your first bet, because um, as I say, we've we've got the information and we can lead you through it. Now the last one is mm. I just want certainty, and I think that probably goes more than one way that the uh, the person who's maybe in near retirement, you know, I'm, I'm really looking for certainty ahead financially. Sure. But I also think that the guy who's investing uh, in those uh, those high risk areas, they really are looking for some sort of certainty somewhere along the line, aren't they? So, yep. so how do you make sure that you get certainty or is it impossible? Yeah, I, I guess uh, what, what people define certainty to be. Um, mm. It's a certain that if you invest in the share market, you will see long term share markets and the returns on share markets will outperform money in the bank. Yep turn deposit or money in bonds or yep. fixed interest. So that's a cer- that's pretty much a certainty, okay? Certainty is you will see volatility. You will see the um, value of your shares rise and fall, okay? But long term, they will rise more than they will fall. So, so that's a certainty. If it sort of keeps you awake at night, sure, you can put your money in the bank. That will give you a certainty. You know your turn deposit rates are gonna be three, three and a yep. half percent, okay? Do you ever think we'll come back to the heady days when you used to get 8% on that sort of stuff? Oh, on bank deposit? Mm. Sure, yep. I mean, we're in a low interest rate environment. Mm. Um, looks like we're going to be for the foreseeable future as well. Um, mm. Globally, they're starting to move up, but um, certainly here in New Zealand, um, I think the Reserve Bank has pretty much indicated they won't be raising rates before 2020, nope. so another couple of years. Um, so I think our average interest rates in New Zealand is around 7 8%. Or maybe even high, eight, eight and a half percent. So that's sort of more normal. This isn't normal what we're seeing at the moment. Mm. So, yep, I think they will go back up. Now, Glenn, you're the head of wealth management and an authorised financial advisor. So, if we want to come and see for some good advice about investing in our future, where do we do that? Sure. So, we're located at 204 Caramu Road in Hastings. As always, our pleasure. You look after yourself. Talk to the same time, same place next time. Thanks, Glenn.